Distal femur fractures. This is from the Orthopedic Trauma Association Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 3. I'm Saqib Rahman and I'm going to be narrating these slides uh, authored by uh, Dr. Christ and previously by Drs. Ostrom and Della Rocca with uh, contributions from the, all the following authors. So the first thing you have to do in, in this first portion of the lecture, we're going to talk mostly about assessment and pre-op planning. Um, <clears throat> obviously you have to assess the fracture and the patient and put it all together and try to determine the personality of the fracture, you know, which is one of the AO terms that's used commonly. Um, figuring other patient issues, is it a polytrauma patient, are there other things you need to take into consideration for treatment of that particular patient. <clears throat> You need to plan your surgery, consider what implants you might need, how you're going to position the patient, technique, think about maybe other injuries that have to be treated at the same time, etc. Um, you have to think about how you're going to reduce your fracture, how you're going to stabilize your fracture, and then what are you going to do afterwards, you know, rehabilitation-wise. So distal femur fractures are articular injuries. Okay, so uh, the sort of overriding principles for management of articular injuries, again, these are um, taught to you uh, uh, in, a in AO basic principles are um, anatomic reduction of joint surfaces, reduction of the articular segment to the diaphysis to restore appropriate length alignment and rotation, stable fixation with uh, safe implant placement and minimal, minimal biologic insult, uh, early motion of the joint and early rehabilitation, and um, these are really principles that apply for almost all articular fractures, and distal femur is no, no exception. <clears throat> so if you have a case like this, you'd have to look at this, uh, think about the patient, say what kind of fracture is this, what's the personality of the fracture, uh, how do we decide on the appropriate treatment. Uh, you may look at this and say, well, okay, well, it's clearly there's intraarticular extension, it's somewhat displaced at the articular surface, but uh, uh, maybe more so in the lateral than the AP. Uh, you may say that uh, there is a fair amount of uh, extension up into the diaphysis, um, so that might start get you thinking about how you may want to uh, definitively treat this. All right. Here is one case where I think well, one of several cases where I think AO OTA classification is very pertinent. It, it, it you know it, it helps you think about uh, what you're dealing with. Uh, it helps you think about treatment um, in terms of you know what your management and surgical treatment will be. Um, so this is the distal femur. So it's the femur. So it's bone number three, and it's the distal end. So it's number three. So it's these are type 33 fractures. Okay. So any periarticular fracture, remember, uh, you have A, B, and C, okay? So an, a periarticular A is a periarticular extraarticular fracture. So if you see all of these, they're all extraarticular, like supracondylar fractures, essentially, okay? Type B is a partial articular fracture, okay? So we usually say B, B for buttress plate. B would be also like a unicondylar tibial plateau fracture, for instance, Schatzker 4, like shown there. So it can be a lateral condyle uh, femur, medial condyle femur, either of which can be treated with buttress fixation. But you also can have the Hoffa fracture or poster condyle fracture, which is maybe not necessarily treated with a buttress plate. But the point is, um, these are all, they are intraarticular fractures, they're different than this. So these are typically treated, and we'll get to this, typically treated with uh, an open approach, okay? Um, so I think with the uh, type A fractures, um, you know, these are amenable to a nail. Um, they're amenable to um, MIPO, minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis, uh, whereas partial articular fractures are really, they have to be open, right? So these are really for uh, ORIF. You want direct visualization of the joint surface. There's really no role for uh, MIPO per se, except perhaps in the most non-displaced fractures that you re think require surgical fixation. <clears throat> now the type C are complete articular fractures, right? So 
these are, I'm spending a lot of time here, but I think the distal femur is an excellent example of uh, the sort of utility of AO classification. Um, so this is partial, and this is complete. Complete articular, right? So complete articular means that the articular fragments are all dissociated from the shaft. All right, so that's not the case here, right? Here, the lateral condyle is still associated with the shaft. Here, in all these three cases, all the articular fragments are completely dissociated from the shaft. So complete articular. Generally speaking, except for the most non-displaced intraarticular extension, um, these are treated with, you know, ORIF, open reduction. Um, if you don't have uh, too much intraarticular involvement, um, you know, possibly with the nail because oftentimes you need to span way up here. So you have to think about, well, if I don't have that much displacement here, but I have to expand all this fracture and get up into the shaft, the nail may be appropriate with, of course, some type of articular fixation um, uh, to compress the condyles, for instance. All right, so we'll, we'll get a little more into this, but I think AO classification really helps you here. So you look at your plane radiographs, um, AP lateral, uh, make sure you don't miss something proximally. Uh, insist on adequate x-rays, all right? Um, if you don't, you can't see what you're doing uh, or you can't see what's going on, you're not going to be able to know what you, what you need to do. Um, don't, don't forget to check a CT scan. So, so many patients nowadays get uh, a CT scan of their abdomen and pelvis and uh, that's a free look at the femoral neck to make sure you don't miss something else. Um, Plain radiographs of the contralateral femur can help for pre-op planning. So if you have severe comminution, you can't recognize what length needs to be, what the patient's normal anatomy should look like, then um, you might have to consider getting the uninjured side. And traction views are, are potentially helpful. So if you have something with severe shortening, uh, you know that ligamentotaxis is going to help. Um, getting a traction view can help show you uh, better approximated where the uh, major fragments lie. So what about CT scans? Well, as with many intraarticular fractures, we like getting CT scans because they give us more details about the articular surface involvement. And the distal femur is no exception. Um, it, again, it's if you have severe shortening and gross angulation, Sometimes it may be better to wait until you have some traction, like a traction view, like an, having an X-fix in place. But um, that's, it's questionable. A lot of times we don't, uh, we don't do staging of distal femur fractures. You don't get an X-fix on there. So it's not like uh, the case with pilon fractures, for instance, where many of them are getting treated with external fixation as a staged treatment. But um, here, you know, you can identify uh, for instance, that uh, there's a posterior condyle fracture that's a separate fragment that you may have missed on x-ray. And here's where CT can be really helpful. Um, in um, Dr. Nork's article, um, going back over 10 years now, um, in open fractures and uh, uh, you know many distal femur fractures, you can miss the posterior condyle fracture, or so-called Hoffa fracture. Um, and again, these are as mentioned here, these are far more common with open fractures, okay, than in closed fractures. So if you have an open fracture, um, oftentimes you're rushing to the OR, but um, make sure you know what you're dealing with, and uh, maybe and then make sure you get a CT scan, make this so that you don't miss that. Don't forget to evaluate the entire patient, right? Uh, Patients should uh, typically, if it's it's a trauma, undergo ATLS. Look for other orthopedic injuries. What about X-Fix? I, I touched on it briefly. Uh, we know that it gets used in the tibia, especially in the plafonds, sometimes in the tibial plateau for temporary stabilization, sort of a staged management technique. However, distal femur fractures, oftentimes you can fix them, even these bad type C fractures without particular delay. Um, but there are cases where it's not appropriate. Patient's condition, uh, patient condition precludes their long procedure. Uh, these are not easy cases and if the patient's really not ready for a, a big long procedure, um, 
and and has and needs some stabilization. External fixation can address that. Other injuries um, that need to be addressed earlier um, might uh, um, cause you to stop and say, okay, well, we need to do something. We'll put it in an external fixator. Open fractures, you may not feel comfortable either because um, this is a fracture you don't treat frequently enough and you haven't gotten all the information you needed and it's in the middle of the night and you don't have your team and your implants and what you need for this fracture. And um, that may be a reason you may go to external fixation. And other non-patient uh, specific factors, OR availability, um, stuff like I kind of was mentioning that can sometimes happen with uh, o open fractures. So this can be, if you're going to do external fixation, this can be done with a spanning knee external fixator. This allows for temporary stabilization of the fracture um, if uh, delayed reconstruction is necessary. Um, of course, you're going to get distraction of the fracture fragments. And uh, this, you know, through ligamentotaxis, allows you to um, uh, get a better, uh, you know, better view of um, the major condyles. Of course, centrally depressed fragments um, are not necessarily going to reduce with ligamentotaxis. And you may keep those pins in place. And an external fixator can act as a reduction aid at the time of definitive reconstruction. However, you, you should try to keep the pins out of the planned surgical field. If, if they get uh, infected or you, you, you get a, a nasty pin site uh, drainage and then your plate's going to go right there, you, you might be pretty nervous about that, causing a later infection. Know your surgical anatomy, all right? So understand the intercondylar notch, how it sits, the posterior condylar alignment, distal femoral valgus. Um, this is, it's not a square block that you're dealing with. Okay, understand the deforming forces, trapezoidal shape of the distal femur. So um, here's sort of a, um, I guess an axial uh, view of the uh, distal femur viewed from inferiorly. Uh, you can see you have this uh, somewhat trapezoidal shape, right? You have this angle laterally, oops, you have this medially, sorry about that line, medially, um, you have um, also uh, this angle, right, from anti fr uh, across anteriorly and posteriorly. So um, again, it's not a square box. Understand the distal femoral anatomy so that you don't penetrate into the intercondylar notch posteriorly right? You don't penetrate through the, um, uh, you know, the um, patellofemoral joint anteriorly, sorry. Um, be careful in also recognizing how the posterior condyle sits. So the posterior condyles project posteriorly with regard to the femoral shaft. So don't do something like this where um, you look at the posterior condyles, you line them up with the posterior shaft, and then you end up with, with this, right? So, you know, you have this big, this big step off here. So recognize posterior condyles don't line up with the shaft. They line up with, or they sit behind the shaft that should reduce to here, right? Um, another thing you got to be careful of is when you, you, when you place a plate laterally that uh, it's going to pull the shaft laterally and um, push the um, distal femoral condyle medially. So you may sometimes end up with something like this if your plate's not contoured properly and you're using cortical screws uh, to, to sort of like pull the shaft over this way, okay? Um, I talked about uh, the uh, valgus uh, typically seen in the knee. So uh, typically your, um, you have about nine degrees uh, relative to the anatomic axis of the femur, right? So you're going to, if you have it where you get a full length image of the uninjured side, it may look something like this. Okay, and certainly when planning you know, osteotomies and reconstructions, we'll get those. For acute trauma, we often don't have uh, these sort of full length films, but again, this is just to sort of give you an idea what you're trying to reconstruct to, right? You're not trying to make the distal femur, you know, just, you know, like this to the proximal tibia. Okay, I mean, you have to recognize that there's, 
there's a valgus angle that you need to reconstruct, right? Sorry for that, but I mean, just, just to sort of give you the t common mistakes that sometimes people will make in the operating room if they're focused very narrowly on only just, only just looking right here and they don't sort of zoom out, um, look above and below and recognize uh, how they restored the normal angle of the, of the knee. Big thing you need to also recognize is uh, muscular deforming forces that, um, that occur. So typically the gastrocnemius causes this extension. So you can see uh, the, you know, the gastrocnemius um, uh, inserts uh, you know, sort of posteriorly here. Uh, it's a little bit too proximal, but posteriorly right about here. And what this causes is it causes, as, as shown here in the arrow, um, the distal femur to rotate this way. Uh, and this extension, and then the hamstrings can cause shortening as well. This can be very difficult to overcome. You have to make sure your patient is relaxed from an anesthesia standpoint. Um, and we talked about this already, recognizing this sort of somewhat trapezoidal shape of the distal femur to make sure that you, know, you don't have screws that are, that are sticking out here that you think are not long, especially here. If you can imagine you could have a screw that's like this long, and if all you're looking at is the posterior part of the distal femur and you don't get a tangential C-arm view or you don't have it open and you can't see this, then uh, you could have screws that are very long and irritating. So be very careful. So with your pre-op planning, you know, this would be a sort of proposed method of attack. And we talked about the importance of the articular reduction. So you reduce, reduce the articular surface first. This can be done with direct reduction techniques. Secure the fixation of the articular surfaces um, with interfragmentary screws, for instance. Restore continuity of the articular block to the shaft. Right? So you're going to go pretty much in, in that order. A reduction of the joint surface, fix the joint surface, and then fix that block to the shaft. Um, now you can have all types of implants at your disposal. Right here you have a blade plate, right? Condylar blade. Here you have a locked plate. And here you have a nail. All right, so these are sort of the, especially on the, the locked plates and the nails, I think currently are the two most commonly used devices for these. So we'll get into the um, fixation options and then retrograde nails and some plates in the next uh, portion of this talk. Thanks.